This episode's made possible by Planful. Hi, this is Russ Porter, CFO of the Institute of Management Accountants. Get ready, because you're about to hear the CFO Thought Leader Podcast. This is episode 939. One aspect that's also really powerful that, that we're trying to introduce more into our thought process and capital allocation framework is payback. Number of months it takes for different products to pay itself back and turn over that capital. Because the other element I think is important when people talk about economics is if product A delivers $500 contribution margin, but it takes you 12 months to pay back, right? which is still a very good payback period, product B could deliver $100 of contribution margin, but it takes you one month to pay back. So if you don't look at payback, you need to think, well, I'm going to do the $500 one and not do any of the $100 one. But when you start adding payback period as part of your capital allocation framework, then you will think, I can do $100 12 times before I can do the $500 one one time. Hi, it's Jack. On today's episode, we speak to Ralph Leong, CFO of Achieve. One aspect that's also really powerful that, that we're trying to introduce more into our thought process and capital allocation framework is payback. Number of months it takes for different products to pay itself back and turn over that capital. Because the other element I think it's important when people talk about economics is if product A delivers $500 contribution margin, but it takes you 12 months to pay back, right, which is still a very good payback period, product B could deliver $100 of contribution margin, but it takes you one month to pay back. So if you don't look at payback, you need to think, well, I'm going to do the $500 one and not do any of the $100 one. But when you start adding payback period as part of your capital allocation framework, then you will think, I can do $100 12 times before I can do the $500 one one time. Hi, I'm Rowan Tonkin, Chief Marketing Officer at Planful. And we're a proud sponsor of CFO Thought Leader. At Planful, we're empowering teams just like yours to drive peak financial performance in every corner of your business. What sets Planful apart? We have purpose-built applications for every department, from FP&A to accounting, marketing to HR, all with built-in financial intelligence. This means we can get you up and running within weeks, and it requires minimal IT involvement. So you can rapidly and seamlessly engage everyone across the business in your key financial processes. Best of all, you can't outgrow us. We take the pain of growing away with an unmatched ability to scale with you. You have an endless runway with Planful. See why over 1,300 customers around the world choose Planful as their flexible, user-friendly, end-to-end financial performance management platform. Go to planful.com and see how you can make financial performance a team sport in your business. Hello, we're speaking to Ralph Leong, CFO of Achieve. Ralph, welcome. Hi, Jack. Thanks for having me. So, Ralph, uh, we're going to ask you to look back. No surprise there. We begin every podcast the same way. But every finance leader sort of has a different set of experiences. So we enjoy asking this question time and again, which is to have you look back and try to identify for us those experiences you believe prepared you for the role? What would those be? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Like the first chapter coming out of undergrad where I was a finance major and a county minor, um, I went into strategy consulting. So it's not, not related to finance. It was uh, with Anderson Consulting. So if you may remember, some of your listeners may remember way back in the day, pre-Accenture, post-Arthur Anderson spinoff. You know, I joined the strategy group. And that was the first time in my career where I felt like someone was teaching me how to think. Right? How do you think properly? How do you think with a framework? How do you think with structure and how you work with a lot of data, but be able to approach data and articulate your thoughts in a structured manner? And they, they don't necessarily teach you that in school. They don't necessarily teach you that in college. Right? So that was the first time in my career. And I take that skill set with me today, whether it's through my investment banking career to today where I am as a CFO 
is to try to approach the world with frameworks and think with structure. That was the first piece, you know, that really first chapter. And then I went, I was there for about four years, went to grad school, post-grad school was my second chapter, which was in investment banking. Um, and within investment banking, I was at Morgan Stanley for about a decade. I started off with your more traditional mergers and acquisitions, so M&A, focused on financial institutions. And back then, I gravitated towards a group for fintech. It wasn't, it wasn't called fintech back then. It's not as sexy as it is today when people talk about fintech. It was more your market makers and your broker dealers, your exchanges. Um, but for me, that was the, the second chapter where I learned the technical aspect of my job, right? The corporate finance side, the real technical finance aspect of being a CFO and really understand capital markets, equity and debt, understood the role that mergers and acquisitions can play in, in the journey of a business. Um, and then also understand the strategic thinking because being part of board discussions and, and discussions with CEOs and CFOs and how they think about growing their business and maybe using cap markets and M&A as another growth channel or to solve a specific problem. But I learned that technical aspect of my job through, through the investment banking period. Um, and, and I spent some time in an investing role as well with Morgan Stanley, where I spent a couple of years as an expat out in Asia based in Hong Kong, where I learned how to be an investor. And that was the first foray that I had to talk to earlier stage founders and entrepreneurs and, and understand what Series A means, Series B means, Series C means, and how you grow a business from that perspective. You know, Because as you know, in the typical investment banking world, you're dealing with large multinationals. You're not necessarily dealing with earlier stage businesses. So in that particular role that I had, I had a chance to learn that aspect, which also benefits me today, right? As a, as a CFO out in Silicon Valley, and even in my earlier roles as CFOs in venture-backed businesses, understanding that dynamic and learning from how founders built their businesses over time during my role at Morgan Stanley really helped me in, in this role today. And fast forward a little bit more, you know, was the, the fintech industry where I spent part of my career still within Morgan Stanley looking after technology and financial technology clients. And that's also very interesting because that helped give the foundation of big picture. How do you grow the business? And typically, I, we would advise them either for an IPO or, uh, or through another M&A deal. And is learning from those leaders, the CEOs and the board members of those companies, how they thought about using an IPO as, as part of the journey or an M&A again, um, and how to think about growing the business, how you expand different product suites, um, and how to build FinTech 2.0, right? Like the, the consumer side of FinTech in the, you know, call it 2014 onwards. Can I uh, take you uh, a little bit back in time? Some of what you shared that we found very interesting and um, we're always interested. You manage consulting. I know that uh, it was Accenture you were with for uh, a number of years. And uh, I, I guess you're up in Toronto at that time. You're in, in, you're, can, uh, you're in Canada. You come to New York, though, for your, your banking career largely, except for when you go overseas. Is that right? Just from a geographic perspective? That's right. That's right. I did Toronto and Vancouver. So I'm Canadian. You know, I grew up in Toronto and Vancouver, spent time there, went to UBC for my undergrad out of Vancouver. Um, so my first gig out of college was with uh, was was up in Canada. But I, I was based out of Toronto, but ended up spending most of my time on a plane flying down to the U.S. You go back to grad school. Are you thinking, is it already finance? You had some banking roots as well, I know. You're thinking a large investment bank. Yeah, that really was the thought process. It was, how do I get, how do I enter this industry? Right? That was a challenging part because I, at that time, I was 28 years old, six years out of undergrad. Uh, and, and the investment banking industry has two natural entry points, right? It's either coming into the grad school as an associate or coming out of undergrad as an analyst. And I was in between. So in order for me to actually enter the industry, I needed to go back to school. So I went to went to get my MBA with that objective in mind is to study, learn, but ultimately end up on Wall Street, end up in a large investment bank. Um, and you know, what is that I needed to get there? Right? So I went there with an objective. The uh, When you are part of the investment banking world, as far as your relationships with C-suite executives, well, I imagine when you became involved in M and A, I bought the executives on the other side of the table with you. 
our operators, man, you know, and they're, you know, they're CEOs and COOs. And did you learn some things from them on the other side of the table? Did you say, you know what, someday I might like to be uh, an operator? What was your thoughts? Yeah, that's a really good question, especially now I'm, I'm on the other side, right? And I can reflect back on what I thought I knew at the time. Yeah, uh, it, it, it's the reality. Way, yeah. like back. Right, exactly. Um, you know, back in the investment banking days, you know, I was always impressed and learned from all of our clients. Right? And then whenever I had the opportunity to sit down with the CEO, CFO, uh, and just hear them, how they speak about the business very strategically, right? They thought of deals as as a vehicle to accomplish something else, right? Like deals were deals because you're solving for something greater, whether it's strategic, you're trying to expand and you're looking at acquiring either for product expansion or geographic expansion or market share capture or something, but it's to accomplish something. Whereas back then on the investment banking side, like deals were the end all and be all, you know, for, for what we did, right? We thought the deals were the cool part and, and, you know, it still is, it's exciting, but, Speaking with the operators, learning from them, and being an operator now, I can really understand you know, deals is part of the journey to help accomplish something greater that's strategic for the business. Let, let me see if I can jar your memory a little bit. Uh, there must have been a deal that you were bullish on, and maybe your colleagues were, and the operators on the other side of the table, no thanks. You know, the day the deal a deal went south for you. Or maybe... It was just circumstances around a, a transaction that just couldn't get done. Anything, anything you can reflect back on for us? I've got one example. It was a failed IPO that we worked on for for probably two years, you know, which is an unusually long time. Right? Um, and it was for a relatively new sector, um, and. The business, you know, we had been spending time with the business. It was a, I would say, a market participant type business. So like the old school 1.0, the institutional type of fintech back then. Market participants, um, broker dealer trading, online, think of an online trading for a different asset class that was not as commonly available, right? When you and I log into E-Trade or Schwab, like you can trade ETFs and equities, et cetera. But back then we're working with a client who, Similar business model, but it was in a different asset class. It was in foreign exchange, and it was fairly new. Right? There was no public companies that were that were traded like that. Uh, and we worked our way through as a lead left book runner to try to run that deal across. Uh, we learned from a sector perspective that it would it would have been a new learning for a lot of investors to get comfortable with, because when you when you go outside of that and you're thinking foreign exchange. You know, how much of that is true principal trading? How much of that is agency trading? What is the true risk level? It's a complete unknown. And it took a lot of time to educate investors on. And we thought we can get over that hump by you know, whether it's industry research and just demonstrating why we're a profitable business. And I think what we failed to realize was investors, they're a lot, oftentimes their goal is to not make mistakes, right? Not necessarily go make sure they have the biggest wins, but also not to lose money, right? So as investor one on one, right? And you know that was that was something that we had underappreciated in terms of how difficult it would be to sell through some of that narrative, right? That hey, there's a lot of upside here. That uh, it's a new industry. We're going to take this company public for you, and you should participate in now because there was just enough uncertainty in that particular business model. Um, you know, and we, we tried for two years, which is an unusually long time for an IPO. It ultimately did get shut down, uh, didn't get the deal done, uh, despite investing a lot of time and efforts and, you know, a lot of great energy into working with the C-suite of that business. Um, we ended up doing it again, you know, another year after that, you know, after we got more investor feedback reposition the company how do we tell that story the operating side also changed parts of the business to make it more public company ready so we learned a ton through it rather than just trying to sell through certain obstacles you know some obstacles are just meant to be corrected or resolved before we can try it again and so ultimately we did that the overall process took three plus years which is extremely unusual for any any company to go through that lengthy process for an IPO, uh, but we ultimately did get it listed and, um, you know, and it's traded since. 
Um, but, you know, even after as a public company, it did struggle at times because it was relatively small because a lot of investors still could not ultimately get comfortable with it, which meant it had a smaller market cap. And when you have smaller market caps, uh, you have fewer investors buying in and out of the, the company. And you don't have equity research. So it did end up in a, in, a, in a tough place as a smaller public company. So lesson learned was, you know, you don't necessarily have to push. Sometimes going public may not be the right decision for certain businesses, right? And investors need to exit. There are different ways you can still find that exit for the investor, and the public company route may not be the right route, the right path. And even if you get to listing, staying as a public company is also not the easiest thing to do. When was it that uh, you would say that you sort of got the operations itch? You made up your mind that. I'd like to get to the operations side. I, and again, I know you joined uh, Achieve in 2021, but I'm sure <laughs> it was back in, uh, I don't know, 20, 2012, 20, when, when did you first begin to think? Uh, like seriously thinking about it, it was in 2014. It was in 2014. Um, I was in the super lucky position to be part of the Alibaba IPO. Uh, and, and as you may recall, you know, it's one of the largest IPOs in history still. And, you know, they had hired our bank, Morgan Stanley, to be the lead left investment bank to help them underwrite that process because it was such a large business, um, a lot of complexity, different businesses within the broader umbrella that gave me an opportunity to really learn about the e-commerce space, about the cloud business, about consumer fintech, and really dig into understanding business models. Um, and for me, that was the first time where I seriously thought, you know what, there's so many interesting aspects of this business. That's not even deal related, right? It's the, you know, how do you run a massive e-commerce business in a country where, you know, consumer internet and mobile penetration is so low. So the upside is huge, even though currently they own 60, 70, 80% of the market already. Like, how do you grow a business like that? It's nothing to do with the deal. It's true operating one-on-one, right? Or you have a great consumer business. Um, that is in the fintech payment, peer-to-peer -peer payment side. Well, how do you build a super app out of that business? It's so like for me, that was in 2014 when we led that deal. When I got what did that raise again? I forget what the uh, the IPO value. 25 billion. Yeah, and um, I mean your participation. Uh, I, I'm sure they had quite a team involved, but uh, did you have spo exposure to their their upper management? We did. In the we did yeah. Yeah, we absolutely did. You know, with with the most senior level of that company's management, uh, it was over the course of 14 months when we spent significant amount of time preparing that IPO process. Um, but we learned a lot. All of us on the deal team learned a lot from the management team because it's such a large and complex business that that encompasses. You know, you have an e-commerce business, you got a cloud business, you have a data analytics platform, you have a consumer-facing payments business and a consumer-facing fintech super app, all encompassed into one. So that really made us focus and and learn about the different aspects, and then bring it all together of how to tell that story to to Wall Street. And again, uh, I began. We began by uh, asking you when you got your operations itch. It was during that. Uh, transaction during that, you know, understanding the size of that business and, you know, everything it takes to operate it correctly. Exactly. Yeah. Huh. Exactly. And just, just being so close to the leadership team and just learning from them side by side and seeing what they do day to day, right. Which is not about the deal, right. It's truly about running a business and the complexity it took to run something like that. So when you do a segue out of investment banking, isn't a recruiter or how do you enter the, uh, the corporate world? It, it was a recruiter. It was a recruiter. And for us, in my family and I, we went out to Asia as an expat thinking it was going to be a two year stint. My wife and I had just gotten married at the time. We thought, hey, this is going to be a fun experience for the two of us. Then we had a first kid out there. Two years became three years. Three years became four. We had a second child out there. And eventually it was time to come back home. I come back home to the US. And a recruiter tracked me down and, and presented me with an interesting opportunity to come back to the US uh, and take a first operator role as a regional CFO. So as you began evaluating opportunities that were out there uh, to be an operator, to step into a CFO role, what is it that's attracting you? What is it that, uh, you know, what type of business are you interested in joining? 
So it's it's a good question because now my perspective is quite different from you know, eight years ago when I first left banking to become an operator. Right? In the very beginning, it was much more about interesting business models, and that was really the main whole, right? What are some interesting technologies, cool technologies, potential large TAMs that we can think of, like that that can really grow into the next big thing. Um, I want to say the first couple of businesses that I were in, you know, certainly check those boxes. Yeah. Right? The first business that I, I joined was called the Eco, and it is a hybrid between, you know, think of if Samsung combined with Apple, combined with Netflix, and you merge some of those products into one, right? You got the, the the TVs plus the phones plus the digital content all combined into one user experience. Right? That was the first business that I went into. Uh, second business that I went into as CFO was I was the the, the Uber for um, uh, 1099 workers, right? For but for groceries and consumer packaged good industry. And when you think of that industry, a lot of the pick and pack inside a grocery store, a lot of the stock in the shelves. When you see behind the scenes. You can create an Uber-like 1099 model for that, right? And this was the software, the platform that had the two-sided marketplace that can bring together your Pepsis and Frito-Lays and Coca-Colas of the world that need stocking and back help and back office help in the stores. And then the 1099 workers who wanted to pick up gigs, right? So that was that business model. Um, Then the third company I went into was Five Stars. And that's where the thought process changed a little bit, right? Five Stars... Definitely great technology because it it, it was uh, a mix of it was one of the very few mix of CRM software for small medium businesses um, combined with payment processing into into one integrated pay plus CRM business. Well, that business was started to basically help local mom and pops, right? And that's where my personal philosophy has started evolving a little bit. Instead of joining companies and chasing after really cool technology and company opportunities. This business stood for helping local mom and pops, oftentimes immigrants, um, you know, immigrant founders for local mom and pop businesses to try to give them the technology that enterprise companies would have. Right? So in terms of CRM and to compete, right? How do you compete with big franchises, with big you know, retailers and your local mom and pop? And, and that mission really changed how I thought about what kind of companies I want to work for next, right? where there's a mix of a double bottom line approach where you want to be in it to make money, right, and 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 do right by your investors, but there's also the the heart component to it, right, where you are doing it to help people, and uh, and achieve is very much the same way, right. Achieve is 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 a company that was built to help everyday Americans get back on their financial track and get back on a better financial footing. That's a good cue, uh, a good segue for me to at, pop the question to you. Yeah, we want to find out about Achieve. So tell us about this company. What does it do? What, what are its offerings, really? Yeah. Um, so Achieve is a 21-year-old business today. Um, it was started from founders coming out of Stanford grad school, um, Andrew Hauser and Brad Stroh coming out of Stanford grad school in 2002. Their thinking as, at the time was they looked around the, the, the markets they looked around the economy and recognized that middle-class Americans often needed the most help to get back on the right financial footing. They also recognized there were a lot of companies out there who were preying on this group, right? Uh, whether it's your ultra high cost debt, uh, debt providers, um, you know, that are pursuing this, that are preying on this group. And we wanted to use technology and use data and use service to help this group instead of giving them more debt and putting them into greater debt. And that's just, that's just a simple premise of, you know, of why they want to start this business is to help everyday Americans. Uh, fast forward to today, Achieve has multiple products and we are the market category leader in, in one core one, which is debt resolution. So debt resolution in a nutshell is a, think of it as a financial rehab program, right? Someone who may have undergone some type of life event, so think divorce or loss of job or family illness, something happened in your life. You used to be a great FICO borrower and something happened in your life and then it knocked you down. Right? And now you're stuck in this near prime segment where you may have a mid 600s FICO score. The big banks are no longer really focused on banking you, right? Because you got knocked down a notch and you're stuck in this world. So like, well, how do I, how do I fix it? How do I get back you know, to where I used to be? Um, and that's what this program is for, right? Is to say, Jack, you know, if you have undergone these issues and you have 
racked up you know, fifty thousand dollars in debt and you've got eight different credit cards and you're just barely making your monthly payment and you're just stuck in this purgatory how do i get out of it right and the rehab program allows you to do that right you would join the rehab program you know we've built over the years because we've done this for 22 years or 21 years we've built over the years you know our own machine learning engine that can optimize okay jack come into the program here's how we can help him negotiate and settle a lot of that debt with these creditors so then there's a win 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 right a win for you jack because you're able to graduate from a program with with no debt or much less debt with a higher FICO score, the creditors also get some of that balance back, right? Because otherwise you may have declared bankruptcy, you may have stopped paying. Them. And then in terms of us, we have a happy customer that we feel like we were able to help them journey back to where they used to be. Right? So that's a core product that we built the business around, created that category 21 years ago, and now we're the national leader in this business. But in addition to this product, we also recognize over time that a lot of people coming into our platform, right? So Jack, you may have said, you know what? I think I need to enter your program, but we may say, Jack, actually you have a house, right? You have a lot of equity tied up in the house. You don't have the liquidity to get out of it because you know the big banks may not be providing a second mortgage or a FICA or, or a HELOC for you, but we can help you with that, right? With that HELOC, you can then consolidate other debt that you have and super expensive debt, free up cash flow to get you back on your feet again. So we introduced new lending products to complement the core debt resolution business. And fast forward to 2023, now we run this as one central, one unified platform. We went through a rebrand last year. We used to be called Freedom Financial Network with multiple sub products and sub names. We brought everything under one house, under Achieve. And now we can service you know, everyday Americans under one, one roof. They come into the business and we can figure out what the right path is for them to help them out. So uh, along the way, what uh, we're interested in how you might have uh, changed the finance function in some way. Was it, uh, again, you arrived in 21, so two years later, but there's been this rebranding, there's been this new umbrella over a variety of offerings. Has the finance function had to uh, you know, be enlarged, be changed, modified? What would you tell us? It, it has. You know, so I... I got pretty fortunate. I came in, inherited a great team, inherited a great function. Um, but that function and team was built for a different period of achieve, right? It was built in pre COVID through COVID where the objectives at the time was, um, you know, making sure books are closed, making sure we have the foundational elements. And I've heard, you know, in, in other episodes that some of your your other CFO guests come in and talk about building that foundational element, right? Whether it's your ERP systems to making sure you have the right financials, making sure you have the right reporting. So at least the management team has visibility. So I got lucky that when I came in, that foundation was already established. So since I've been here though, my job has to, you know, has been to take that foundation to start adding levels on top of that, to turn it into a more strategic, forward-looking uh, strategic function where I built up strategic finance as a separate team. We beefed up our FP&A capabilities because now we want to help be at the table, work with the business leaders um, to give them the right insights so that we can make better decisions, about better, that, smarter decisions. I'm sorry, about that FP&A capability that you built up. I mean, does that mean one or two new hires? Does that mean new tools? When you decided to say, how do we establish this? What, what, where was the investment made? Uh, both, actually, both. New hires, uh, not just number of bodies, but the type of hire that we're bringing in. Right? So I'm, I'm going to just club um, FP&A and strategic finance into one, right? where the folks that we've brought in since I've been here have been the the forward facing strategic finance background people where they can look at um, not just how financials are reported and what they actually mean and you and you read out you know variances et cetera but also use finance partner with leadership to help solve problems and provide insights so let me give you a couple of examples we've built up tooling too so for example when we think of go to market right and we're acquiring customers through digital channels um, we strategic finance and FP&A partner with the marketing team, built up the tooling so that now we can look at it. We're going to spend, you know, call it $20 million a month to acquire customers through your typical digital channels. How do you optimize that $20 million? Right? Ideally, you have visibility into 
which channel, which effort, which state, which city, right? And you have detailed unit economics for each of those. Then you should be able to just waterfall from the most profitable state, right, to the most profitable channel and effort. Then your next dollar goes towards the second most, third dollar goes towards the third most, and you can waterfall down. And that's how you should spend your money, right, to maximize your ROI versus without the tooling, without that type of thinking, you could just be spending $20 million and you get the full spectrum. Some may be negative contribution margin, some may be positive, right? But you just get one big batch instead of being very surgical to go from top to bottom, right? So that's just one example of the tooling that we built, but it starts with bringing in the right people who can then build the right tooling and can work with the work with the business and educate them on that mindset. We wonder if there's a business dynamic or particular measure that you have sought to educate the organization about. It might have been one that was just not getting the attention you thought it deserved as you arrived twenty back in 21. Is there some measurement or a business dynamic that you have sought to make the uh, educate the company about and bring it to it, the attention of uh, managers or some part of the organization? So I've got two examples. You know, one of them I'm going to say for a little bit later on in, in a different segment about the aha moment. Uh, the one I'm going to share with you now is is more just about reporting and process and cadence, right? So one of the we've since I've joined, we've always had a typical monthly overall business review. Right? We go through a financial pack, and all the leaders join. Uh, we will walk through how do we do last month, how do we do versus plan, what are we going to do next month. Right, your very typical reporting out package. Um, what we added to that visibility is regular cadence within each month where we look at just the operating KPIs, right, where we double click on certain KPIs that really drive our forward looking bookings or forward looking rec- uh, revenue recognition and so forth, um, as well as a separate one that talks about pure financial KPIs to understand where we need to go, um, how are we tracking towards a plan on the finance side. And then what strategic decisions we have to make, what do we have to debate? So instead of the traditional approach of you go through and you present a bunch of slides and this is your monthly business review, is to bring in these two separate smaller group discussions where you double click on each of those variables and the discussion is focused about what are the challenges, what do we have to debate, what decisions do we have to make for next month and next quarter. Right? That cadence that we introduce, so that, that process uh, type of meeting in a regular cadence help, helpful because then allows us an opportunity to debate certain topics and focus on decision making rather than an hour of reviewing a deck that's more passive and, and backwards looking. Nice. Thank you for that. It would seem finance leaders have begun to more closely examine how their organizations are leveraging AI and whether there are mm-hmm. areas that might be lagging in terms of costs and time savings as well as as well as some of the strategic benefits that AI might offer, has your team undergone a AI reality check lately? Well, it's it's funny you bring that up because just last month we had a company wide hackathon. Uh, we had launched this hackathon it because of the of AI being much more topical, and we wanted to open this up to all of our employees. Right, it was company wide. Um, 3,000 people were able to submit ideas, raise their hand to join different teams. And we ended up having 35 teams, over 140 employees. And the ideas range from looking at how do we use AI and data to improve our current processes, create new products, create new ideas and tools. So we saw everything from chatbots that drives how we can personalize um, the experience for our members that come through the program. Um, to how do we use data to extract from PDFs to, to get into uh, uh, verification processes within you know, throughout the, the, uh, the onboarding cycle, right? So people are, had great ideas, whether it's very detailed into a part of a, of a process that we currently have today or just macro ideas of driving personalization or even using AI to create a new product and the, you know, the next app that we may launch. Definitely topical. We are thinking a lot about it. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, like we're a business. I mentioned we are 21 years old, but that also means we've captured a significant amount of data during these two decades through different cycles, ups and downs, different economic cycles. Um, and 
And a lot of the questions, how do we use that data to our competitive advantage and hopefully use some AI to, to build into the, uh, the day-to-day processes? Well, tools. we're going to jump to our finance strategic moment question where we we're just asking you to share a moment of insight that you've had along the way. We, we know you've had many of these, but what would you like to share with us? So the, the one that I thought has been most impactful, it's happened a couple of times uh, in my career, similar, uh, once at five stars, you know, and I'm living it right now at Achieve also. It's when people talk about unit economics, there's so many different flavors of unit economics. And I'm sure all your guests have come in and talked about a bunch of different flavors. You have the customer level unit economics where, you know, with multiple products, you can drive lifetime value, right? You have product level unit economics where you want to make sure that with just one use case, one product only, you know, that you're making money on a per product level, right? So people usually measure the contribution margin that each product can deliver or the net margin each product could deliver. One aspect that I realized last company and this company that's also really powerful that, that we're trying to introduce more into our thought process and capital allocation framework is payback. Number of months, it takes for different products to pay itself back and turn over that capital. Because the other element I think it's important when people talk in economics is if product A delivers $500 contribution margin, but it takes you 12 months to pay back, right? Which is still a very good payback period. Product B could deliver $100 of contribution margin, but it takes you one month to pay back. So if you don't look at payback, you need to think, well, I'm going to do the $500 one and not do any of the $100 one, right? But when you start adding payback period as part of your capital allocation framework, then you will think, well, Jack, I can do $100 12 times before I can do the $500 one one time. Right? So from an enterprise level, when you factor in payback period and how efficient you can use that capital, right, then you'll conclude that, you know what, maybe that second product that may have a lower contribution margin per unit, but because it's so much more capital efficient, that may be a better strategic path for us to allocate more capital to. Right? And I think for me, that was definitely an aha moment when I was at five stars and we're trying to crank out efficiency and productivity and think of, you know, where do we allocate capital, especially during COVID for you know, most companies where capital was, was scarce. Um, and even today, right, where we have a much larger business, our problem today is we have too many opportunities. Right? And we have too many opportunities, we just got to focus and figure out where do we direct capital towards to maximize your ROI and that's strategic for the future and introducing this payback in terms of number of months combined with unit economics at the product level combined with unit economics at the customer level thinking about it this way has helped us a lot from episode 924 this is one minute with rob goldenberg cfo of six cents I take the total ideal customer profile, and then I hit another button. I call it the TAM Now button, right? Who's actually in market to buy a product like ours or has a pain point that our product addresses? And that gives me another list. Then I take both those lists and do what all CFOs do and just apply a dollar amount to each of the companies on that list. And now I have our TAM. And by the way, this goes over great when I'm talking to particularly a a potential new investor, or if you think about a a potential IPO in our future, you know, a public market uh, investor that maybe can invest now, but wants to be educated prior to a potential IPO, they always ask about your TAM. And I can say, here's my TAM. And by the way, this isn't some wishy-washy number. This is how we develop our product what it's designed to do. Uh, We are going to jump to our mentoring round where we'll ask you several quick questions intended to inform and inspire future finance leaders. We always like to have you look back to that first 60 days when you first stepped into a CFO role. Just think about that. And uh, we're looking for advice for new CFOs, clearly. But we're wondering, when you think back to that 60 days, you had a set of expectations. And then again, there was something you wish somebody had told you. (laughs) If you could go back in time and give yourself a piece of advice, what would it have been? 
Oh, that's such a good question. And um, my experience at Achieve for that first 90 days was quite different than my experience in my prior companies. Uh, and I think in, the, in a much better way, which, which answers your question here. When I first got here, the mandate was take your time, learn the business, don't come in guns blazing and, you know, try to add value and sound smart and um, be very secure. Come in, be very secure, take your time, learn the business, invest as much time as you need to build those authentic relationships up front. Right. And then after 90 days, you know, so, you know, during this period, start jotting down all your insights, all the thoughts that you have, but just learn, take your time to learn, right? And then after 90 days, you know, then you can start contributing. Then you can start thinking about what it is that you want to prioritize tackling and how do you work with your business partners? And that's very different than my approach in my prior companies. I think a lot of it was, I'm still learning the CFO gig, you know, I am learning how to be an operator. Um... And, and, you know, like other guests have also said in your show, right, there's a little bit of imposter syndrome, right? You have your own insecurities. Like you want to come in and demonstrate, this is why you hired me, right? This is the impact that I want to have right away. And you don't take that time to learn the business to allow you to make better recommendations and be a better business partner. And I've always felt that pressure. Maybe I was put on myself, but I always felt that pressure to two companies that I was CFO at until when I got here where the founders said to me early on to just take your time, right? We don't want you to actually, we actually don't want you to do anything, you know, in month one. We want you to learn and build great relationships because you're going to be here for a long time and you'll have plenty of time to add significant value, right? So someone finally said it to me and, you know, I would love to share that advice with, with people who are taking not just a CFO role. I'd say in general, when you join a new company is to learn the business first and, and, try to hold back and, and deal with your insecurities and, you know, not try to add value right away and try to sound smart and make, you know, um, learn the business and nice. make you better. Public. Ralph, we'd like to ask our guests to reflect a little on the personal side. We're wondering if you have a habit, part of a daily routine, something that sets you apart. Uh, Ralph's always done this, not really certain why, but it's what people know about you. It's sort of like uh, what they point out. And it might be something a family member would point out to us. Yeah. Um, so I, I'd say my colleagues here, and probably, yeah, my, my colleagues would know that I, I don't <laughs> drink coffee. Uh, no real vices except for boba teas. So I do drink at least one a day, if not even more. And that's, you know, that's my happy place. And, and they just, what, know what is it? Uh, Sorry, These bubble boba teas, right? So bubble teas or boba teas, and uh, and you know they know that I have at least one of these a day, and oftentimes when they <laughs> when they know that it's about to ha- they're about to have a difficult conversation, they would bring a bubble tea with them. Our, our, our listeners are more hip than I. What what is that? What what exactly is that? It is our, a, our listeners know, and they're they're yeah. um, whatever. But 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 I need to know. I, I'm going to find a way to send you one. Um, but it is, you know, it, it's just, it's. Is it refrigerated? Is it something you can find in any uh... store? So it's it's different flavors of tea where there are tapioca balls at the bottom or different types of toppings at the bottom. I'm looking at them now online here. They look, they look yeah. tasty. You got to try one, Jack. I'm game. Bubble tea. Ralph, what about a, a book selection? Would you have one for us? The, the one that. So there's two that I have in mind, uh, three actually. Two of them I read a long time ago in grad school that really helped. Me. I remember it till this day because it's it's so important part of my my career switch from consulting to investment banking. And and I'm sure many of your readers have, uh, your readers have read this too. It's Liar's Poker and Accidental Investment Bank. Right. So I think those are two famous books back in the late '80s, late '90s, and early 2000s. The one that I'm reading now, though, is is, uh, is the Andre Agassi book, you know, Open. So I, I've always been a tennis player. You know, remember back in the day, Michael Chang was was the you know the famous American Chinese American tennis player, and yeah. I think just most like most Chinese Americans and Chinese yeah. Canadians who play tennis aspire to be the next Michael Chang, and, and I was certainly one. Uh, but my favorite player was Andre Agassi. You know, through the whole journey with the long hair, the neon. 
image is everything commercials, but through the full ups and downs, right? Where he peaked, he got in. Lost yeah. And there were, were, there were. Climbed there were back to be number one in the career. world, yeah. you know, completely different approach. Like it just shows how even for someone like that to be able to still learn throughout their career, right? And to go through the ups and downs and come back and still come back to the top, right? I actually wrote my MBA application essay about Andre Agassi. So for him to have the book to come out, you know, many, many years later after I graduated was, was nice to, to read it. Wow. Great, great story for us. Great, great selection for us, uh, Ralph. Thank you so much. We are up to our final question for you, which is to ask you to look forward uh, for the coming 12 months and share with us what your priorities are as a CFO. What would those be? Um, two primary ones. They're both capital related. So we are raising equity for the corporate business. Um, that's priority one. You know, we have been a bootstrap company, as I mentioned to you earlier. Uh, so we are going to market to raise equity after 21 years to inject additional equity into the business because there's so much demand for products and services. We see there's so much tailwind coming out of COVID, coming out of the pandemic. Uh, this is our opportunity to help more customers or help more members. And uh, raising that equity allows us to, to bring it more into the funnel. So that's priority one. Priority two is also capital related but it's on the lending side of the business, right? As, as you know, between the banking crisis to extremely high interest rates, like the capital market itself is quite disrupted, right? Just in general for all digital lenders, even bank lenders. And my team and I were building out a much more thoughtful funding strategy to bring in different pools of capital that can fund our lending businesses, our loans, you know, which ultimately is consolidation loans and HELOCs. They can, again, help our members save cash flow, reduce debt, et cetera. So those are the two priorities, capital related. Uh, so I'm traveling a lot these days, but it's, it's been great getting back out there. Ralph Leung, thank you for joining us on CFO Thought Leader. Thank you for having me, Jack. Really appreciate this. Enjoy this. Thank you. Thought Leader listeners, as you have perhaps already heard or even seen, we're now featuring the career lessons and moments of strategic insight shared by our CFO guests as Thought Leader videos. You can now find these videos on our blog at cfothoughtleader.com and of course our newsletters, but also on LinkedIn. If you haven't already, please go ahead and follow our CFO Thought Leader LinkedIn company page, and you'll be certain not to miss a single Thought Leader video debut. CFO Thought Leader, the number one thought leadership platform exclusively for and by CFOs. As always, thank you for listening.